Thanks, Beth. That was beautiful. It's lovely to hear the nylon string guitar. We don't hear enough of the nylon string guitar. <laughs> yeah. That was the first guitar I ever learned how to play. I was crap at it. So, um, yeah, and thank you, Hugo, for your meditation, and, and thanks for being here and sharing a bit of your heart and um, and in such an authentic and sincere way. So, um, yeah, uh, hey, everybody. And, yeah, we're going to start a new series on the great questions. And, um, yeah, I was I was feeling, you know, stirred by that Martin Luther King quote, um, particularly about the weather. Let's talk about the weather, um, especially as it relates to the great questions. My wife was telling me she saw this thing about how Brits um, – talk about the weather, but it's really code. You know, it's like, um, man, it's so gloomy and cloudy today. Translation, I'm feeling depressed and I don't know if I can go on. The response is something like, well, you know, on, on Saturday, the sun's supposed to come out for 10 minutes. Translation, it's okay, we're all going through this. Do you want to go to the pub later? So... <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a way of talking about things that are important. Really, the great questions by, with code, you know. What's that? Um, tell the truth on a slant. That's Emily Dickinson. I don't have quite the line, but something like that. So uh, that's what we want to try to do is dance with the great questions, but also from the side and also mention the weather from time to time and... Um, and I hope the series goes on for a little while because I want it to be like a conversation. And I'm already getting from you all little emails and suggestions about what are the great questions and um, and what does it mean to be the kind of person that would wrestle with things that are challenging or things that keep coming up or things that have no right to go away. So I wanted to begin with a poem, David White poem, one of my favorites. So we'll read the poem, and it's called Sometimes. Sometimes, if you move carefully through the forest, breathing, like in the old stories, sometimes if you move carefully through the forest, breathing, like the old ones in the old stories, who could cross a shimmering bed of leaves without a sound, You come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests. Conceived out of nowhere, but in this place, beginning to lead everywhere. Requests to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. Yeah, questions that have no right to go away. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Tiny requests that won't leave you alone. Requests that tell you to stop doing what you are doing right now. I wanted to begin with this kind of terrain, because sometimes when you hear the great questions right away, it's like, is there a God? You know, good question. But what if you were moving in the world like in the old stories, like the old ones that could move across a shimmering bed of leaves without making a sound? What would happen to you? What kind of tiny requests would 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 you catch in the wind, like the way you catch the scent of something? And in fact, um, here's, a, here's a challenge. I want you to go back to childhood. All right? Go back to childhood in your mind here. After all, time is an illusion. You're just a kid anyway. And here you are as a kid. And, and what were some of those first questions that started arising where the adults, the big people in your life, didn't really have satisfactory answers for. It's not like you thought necessarily they're wrong and I believe something different. 
I'm talking about those little seeds of curiosity like, huh, I don't know if I'm quite satisfied with that answer. Or I'm not even sure if that was the right question. Or do big people even know what they're talking about? You know, I mean, it's like those tiny, where did those come from? As you were moving across the landscape of your childhood, where did they arise? Who planted those little tiny seeds? And what happened to them if you put those little seeds out there in the world? Were they dismissed? Were they welcomed? Were they, who knows? What, I mean, like, think about them. What were some of those early questions? We were talking about this in, in, the, pre, in the pre-talk gathering, the pre-talk conversation. Someone said, Teresa said, uh, how'd they get all those animals in that boat? You know? It could be something like that. Or, um, or here's, here's a kind of a beautiful and simple and question that arose, which was, why, Dad, do you put that thing in your mouth and light it that smells? You know, what is that? What are, where are those qu- little tiny questions arising? Like, I remember um, I was told when I was a kid that when I go to heaven, if I go to heaven, if I just do, say the right things, um, all my questions will be answered. And I thought, okay, good, good. I'm going to get there, and then all my questions will be answered. You know what the next question was? Then what? Like, <laughs> and that kind of scared me, you know, like, then what am I going to do? So that's one of those like tiny seeds, like no one told me that. They just arose out of childhood. And, and my guess is you still carry these questions. I bet you have questions that arose when you were five that you still don't have answers for. Those are the great questions, Really? And they're probably related to the artists and poets and philosophers and, and whatever who have turned their life in one way, shape, or form to speaking into these great questions. I'm sure your tiny seeds aren't that far off from some of the, what we typically think of as the great questions. I remember another one I was told, of course, that God is controlling everything. God's in control. And I remember very... I was very young. I would move my hand quickly and think, I think I controlled that. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> but it was a question, you know. And, and, and if I asked anyone, is God in control? Oh, yes, God's in control. God's in control. And I just move my hand a little bit. And I don't know if that's true. Or I don't know what that means, really. So there seems to be something about the human capacity to question that I think is essentially human. That's kind of what I'm saying. It's essentially human. It just rises up within us. Just the capacity even to wonder and to question and to carry our curiosity forward. And what happens when we lose that or shove it down or ignore it or pretend we don't actually carry questions, big or small? What happens to the psyche, I guess? I mean... I guess we're not fully ourselves and we start to lose the dance between the known and the unknown. Isn't that life, you know, a dance kind of between the known and the unknown? And, and then as soon as you know, you know, then the, then the dance moves change. <laughs> the choreography changes and you're like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not so sure. And it's this, it's this kind of troubling dance that I think is so powerful. And I think in some ways, maybe questions are related to longing, like like our longings. And it's not just like we're longing for answers. It's like in, <laughs> in the afterlife, all your questions will be answered. There's something like dissatisfying about that because the longing is still there. It doesn't resolve the longing and and. I think longing and questions and longing and wonder and longing and curiosity, they like hold hands somehow. And I think it's, a, it's an essential part of being human. And, and in some ways it's precious, this kind of longing and curiosity and wonder. <laughs> At 3.30 I woke up and because I forgot to put my clothes in the dryer and And after I thought about that, I thought about something very strange. And I thought, hmm, why did this image come into my head? I remember, so I had an archaeology professor 
when I was in graduate school named Gabi Barkai, and he discovered, well, at the time, the oldest Hebrew script ever found. And he discovered this in a tomb near Scott's church um, in Jerusalem. And uh, it was around the neck of a woman, this, the writing. And it was a tiny silver scroll that she was buried with. And very tiny, like imagine like a, a quarter rolled up, something like that. It was square, not, not a quarter, but I'm just saying something about that size. And a tiny silver scroll. And it took Gabi and his team a long time to figure out how to unroll it because they wondered what was in it. And they finally, they finally came up with a, with a method, which was to cut it very carefully into strips and then unroll it. Yeah, I don't know why it makes me feel emotional. It's like, I think it's because of just, it's like ancient people and modern people, it's, we're that close to each other, you know. It sounds like a long time ago, and just thinking about the, the tender care of burying someone with a silver scroll around their neck, you know. It's, it's kind of beautiful. So anyway, they unrolled it. And any five-year-old kid could read what was on it, really. Any, you know, Jewish kid. Um, someone who knew, who, knew, who knew Hebrew and understood the, at least could read the ancient script. And it said, Yevarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, which is the beginning of, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace. That's what's on the scroll. You can see it in the Israel Museum if you ever go. It has its own little case. <laughs> um, it's such a beautiful poem. I think it's in Leviticus or Deuteronomy. I don't remember which. It's such a beautiful poem. You know what I, I, I realized this morning when I, after I forgot to put my clothes in the, in the dryer, when that image came into my mind of the scroll, that it's a, it's a poem about a question. It contains a question and a longing in it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Like, may this happen. Do you know what that implies? It doesn't always happen. May you find peace. You can feel the longing in there. That, it's like being buried with a question, you know? And that's what it's like where I imagine I haven't died yet, but I'll still I'll be buried with a question, you know. I'll still be carrying something around my neck, a kind of longing, you know. Okay. And I was thinking about questions in general and, I was, and, and the ways in which my own life, like if I'm just looking at the course of my own life, how it changed here or there just by questions arising. Like I first went to Israel in the year 2000 something, 2000 or 2001, and it was my very first trip there. And on maybe the second day, I had this feeling, feeling and thought kind of combined, which is, was very simple. I don't know what I'm talking about. That was the, that was the feeling. Like, I don't really know what I'm talking about. And, and then that was followed shortly by, I don't know really anything about the Bible. Although I can tell you a lot of stories, but I don't really, I don't even know what it is. And that single question changed the course of my life. I didn't know that at the time, but it, you know, all of a sudden whew, changed the course of my life. Or I remember the very first time I, I was at a program and um, a retreat, an intensive, and, and uh, they said to us, well, if you have any dreams, write them down, and in the morning we'll, we'll work with them. And I, w I would have said at the time, I don't really remember my dreams. I remembered a couple childhood dreams. That's about it. But I wasn't a dreamer, you know, plus all that stuff is kind of woo-woo and weird. Tell me your dreams. Um, so <laughs> I woke up. I had a dream. I sat down at the table. Anyone have any dreams? Yeah, I had a dream. So I went into the dream, and and... I closed my eyes, because that's what the person invited me to do. Close your eyes, and I, I entered the dream. I went back into the dream. I, I didn't know it was possible. I was like, all of a sudden, I was back in the dream and wandering around the landscape. And I don't really remember even what the person was saying, but they were sort of drawing out all these things 
the emotional landscape of the dream and it was having an effect on me and all of a sudden I found myself crying and I'm like, what is happening to me? And I came out of that and I had a similar thought. I don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) I don't know what this is. I just walked into a landscape. I just walked into a country that I didn't know existed. And I don't know what else is in there. I don't know what else is in my psyche. I don't know what I don't know. And that, that also changed my life, you know. A question. I mean, did, and maybe you want to think about your own life in this way. In what way. In what ways have questions sort of altered your course in unexpected ways? Even falling in love, isn't that a question? Like, like what is happening to me? Who is this person? Do you remember that feeling of like the, the embarrassment, the trepidation, the fear of telling someone for the first time that you loved them? Do you remember that? Like, I'm going to say the words, I love you. And you know what's amazing about that? You don't know how the other person is going to respond. It's a question as much of, as a statement. Like, am I going to be received here? It's relational in, in its dynamic. Like, we are in relationship to everything else. And we carry our questions forward in that way. Like, I mean, how many of you now could be for sure, define what love is. And once you did, we'd all say, done. Mission accomplished. We publish it on our website. Billions of people around the world would say they found it. Do you still, I mean, don't you still wonder what it is? Where does it go? <laughs> where do, from, what, from where does it arise? I suppose, like, a sure way to end a relationship is to end your questions, to stop your curiosity, to say, I figured the other out. It's done. My therapist confirmed that they're a narcissist and (laughs) kind of problem solved. Now I need boundaries from the narcissist and so forth and so on. And Yeah, I mean, we we all have that tendency to want to label, which in a way shuts down the questions. My guess is that the greatest danger to ourselves and to our relationships and to our neighbors and to the earth and to our civilization, I suppose, is our attachment to certainty. You know, the way like we get our talons in something and it's like, um, I, I know, and, and the world gets smaller suddenly. And it's like the suppression of doubt, you know, and, and we crave that and we want, we want that and it seems to shut things down. And, um, and then we start playing games around our own rightness, I suppose. This is why I'm always picking on the algorithm. I'm going to keep picking on the algorithm because I think something very important is happening in, this, in our culture, Okay. Very important and very hidden and very subtle. Do you know what an algorithm is? It's the suppression of doubt. It's the suppression of curiosity. It's the suppression of carrying your question forward. An algorithm confirms your bias. That's its full-time job. It operates autonomously 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whether you're sleeping or waking, and its full-time job is to confirm your bias and you just wake up innocently and open your phone. And there it is again. And it has a secondary job, which is in, it's going to turn you into an economic profile and sell you things that confirm your bias. So they make money on it. <laughs> and we have just accepted that's, that's, the, that's the world we live in. That's media. And we're not smart enough to not be taken by this. We're really not. I'm not smart enough. None of us are. Every single thing that comes across your screen is being run by an algorithm that suppresses questions and doubts and feeds you. I saw this article that said 70% of evangelical groups on the Internet are bots from foreign countries. 
Now, you could say, oh, <laughs> probably the evangelical's fault, you know. No, it's not, which tells you probably 70% of everything else on your phone is a bot. That's just bias confirmation, bias confirmation. The world gets smaller and your questions get smaller and your certainty sinks in. And now I know I'm confirmed once again. This proves that I'm right. Do you, do you feel what I'm getting at here? That's not moving across a shimmering bed of leaves without making a sound. <laughs> Which David White, I think, um, is inviting us into a way of being so that we can get closer to the questions that matter. A way of being. Like, here's how to walk in the world if you want to get closer to questions that really matter. I just all of a sudden remembered the emperor has no clothes. That's an algorithm. That's what an algorithm does. The emperor is standing there naked, and he kind of looks down and he thinks, I don't think I'm wearing any clothes. But everyone around him says, oh, what you're wearing is so beautiful. It's magnificent. You know, he says, well, maybe that's, yeah, I guess I am. And it wanders around. And, and that's what an algorithm does. It, can, it floods you with what you want to hear. And that whisper that says, I might be naked here, it gets pushed down. It's amazing how these stories like reveal something that's deeply true about human nature and about the world, and they just keep popping up again. In that story, if I'm not mistaken, in the oldest version, it's a slave that's able to, to recognize and says out loud, you're naked, you don't have any clothes. And we read the story and we think, oh, I'm probably the slave. You know, I would, I see. No, the story is that you're the emperor, <laughs> That's what the story is about. So maybe a question you want to carry is, how do I move in the world? How do I move like this? Like the way David White says, sometimes if you move carefully through the forest, breathing, like the ones in the old stories who could cross a shimmering bed of leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests. Requests. What if I moved a bit like this in my own life, in, in my backyard, and then in the forest, and in the 4th of July celebrations? And what if I moved like this? What kind of tiny and troubling requests might arise? Like, why are there fireworks? And why do they go on for days and days and days and days and days and days and days? And days? Something like that. And maybe there's a question even behind that, you know, questions that can make or unmake a life. I, um, I don't know if you've ever read that poem by Rilke where he's describing the head of Apollo, the statue. He's describing the statue. I think he's in Rome or something. And, he's, and it's a very beautiful poem. And he's in, going into great detail about the beauty of the head of Apollo. And here's the very last line. Change your life. It's the very last line. It's like if you're really paying attention, like moving across a bed of leaves, like really looking at an Apollo statue or, or really opening up your field of awareness to what's actually happening. Sometimes tiny but troubling requests come in and they say things like, oh, I covered my mic. Change your life. Change your life. Or, how's David White put it? Um, stop what you're doing right now. <laughs> stop what you're doing right now. So I want to invite you this week, over the next few weeks, over the next few months, to be in conversation with your own questions, to attempt to move in a certain way to allow these to arise. I mean, what are the great questions? What would you say? How would you? What are the personal ones to you? What are the transpersonal ones? What seems to arise in the field? Um, David White has a whole article about this poem sometimes, where he lists some questions. You should read it. You can look it up. Maybe I'll put it in the newsletter because it's worth, it's worth clicking on. Here's one of the questions that David White says arises. Here's a good one. Do you know how to have a real conversation? Which is what Hugo's uh, um, meditation was on. Do you know how to have a real conversation? Now, that's a question that has no right to go away. Wouldn't you agree? Do you know how to have a real conversation? And 
So what might arise for you if you, if you let this happen? Maybe I want to say like a couple more things. Let's try something. I want to invite you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. We'll, we'll do a little imagination journey. Very short one. Won't be long. So close your eyes and let's just imagine you're in a field, a very beautiful field of some sort. And it's a sunny day. It's like today. It's like uh, the day where you really feel that summer is here. And, and you're moving across the, the field and it's kind of lit from within. And, and you come to the, the edge of a pond and it's like a very beautiful pond and it's it's bubbling up in the center. It's like as if it's coming right up from the earth because it is and the water's clean and and you're reflecting just on the beauty of this place and of the pond and feeling your own relationship to the wild world and to the earth and and you're looking into the pond and you can see even a bit of your own reflection and you start to become sort of just curious about, you know, things like who am I and what are my questions, really? What questions am I carrying that I have no right to go away? And, and you remember all of a sudden that you have a scroll in your pocket, a tiny scroll. It's a scroll that you were given many years ago, maybe even when you were a kid. And it has the great questions on it, but you've been too afraid to open it. And you pull it out of your pocket and you unroll the little scroll and you start to read on the scroll your own questions, the one you've been carrying. And just hang out here for a minute and see what arises in your imagination. Just a little check in here. How many of you saw some kind of question or something arose in the field there? Yeah. So carry that as a little seed. Trust that. Hmm, wonder where that came from. What would, what, would, what would it be like to sit with that particular question? In some ways, I'd like to say that to carry your own questions and not someone else's is, is what true adulthood is. <laughs> or growing up, or authenticity, or something like that. Um, and when we carry them well, I think, when we carry our questions, we're also joining kind of a choir or a chorus of our ancestors who, in their own way, carried their questions. Uh, like we're in harmony with them in some way. And um, There's resonance between what we're carrying in the way that we're carrying it and the great poets and prophets and artists and philosophers and weavers and cooks and medicine men and women and who carried their questions in the way they carried them. And so I want to try to attempt not only to just wrestle with questions that over the next you know few months, but to fill the space with questions. Like this space, like fill it with questions and just... See how it changes the atmosphere. You know how like when you can feel a storm approaching in the air before it arrives? You know that feeling? Oh, hopefully one will happen this year. I, w I was camping at Grand Haven, whatever, right there once, and I watched a storm roll in, and, and I could feel the electricity in the air, you know? Well, that kind of thing. Let's, let's fill the space here with 
with questions and questions that have no right to go away and and see what happens and um, I'll end with the poem. Sometimes, if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories who could cross a shimmering bed of leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests, conceived out of nowhere, but in this place, beginning to lead everywhere. Requests to stop what you are doing now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. (laughs) Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. Thanks for listening.